Good evening. I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Hugh Ross. Dr. Ross received his PhD in astronomy from the University of Toronto and was a postdoctoral research fellow for five years at Caltech. He founded Reasons to Believe in 1986 and has spoken at hundreds of universities and in in, in conferences around the world, bridging the gap of science and faith. Let's welcome Hugh, Dr. Ross. Well, thank you, and let's see if we can get this uh, keynote presentation up here. Here we go, thank you. Um, yeah, if you want to get some of our uh, free resources, uh, you can do it through your smartphone. Just uh, text Q to 31996, and that will get you uh, several uh, free videos, book chapters, articles, and a lot more. And if you don't have a smartphone, we're actually giving some away at our book table out front. But as announced, my topic is Cosmic Reasons to Believe in a Jesus Christ. And uh, I was an astronomer first and then, then a Christian. And my studies in astronomy uh, began when I was seven years of age. Uh, that's when I was reading uh, five books in astronomy and physics a week. And the first book I read in cosmology was by Sir Fred Hoyle, Nature of the Universe. And the book is very anti-Christian, however, there is a single sentence in the book where Fred said there's a good deal of cosmology in the Bible. It is a remarkable conception. And I didn't pick up a Bible until I was 17 years of age. But when I did, I discovered that what Fred said was true, that the Bible actually has 10 times as much to say about the origin and history of the universe than all the rest of the holy books of the world's religions combined. And it makes four points repeatedly. Number one, that the universe can be traced back to a singularity beginning. Now that's an astrophysical term. It means an actual beginning of all matter, energy, space, and time. And then the Bible talks about how the universe continuously expands from that beginning. Under laws of physics that don't change, where one of those physical laws is a pervasive law of decay a law that applies to the entirety of the universe. And what I'm going to do in the next few minutes is show you where in the Bible these cosmological statements are made and how the latest discoveries in astronomy and physics establish that what the Bible stated about the universe thousands of years ago indeed is correct. And I find that no matter where I speak in the world, uh, people are aware of the first sentence of the Bible in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. They may not be aware that the Bible actually makes that kind of comment repeatedly. Hebrews 11.3, the universe that we can detect, did not come from that which we can detect. And when it talks about the heavens and the earth, in biblical Hebrew, there is no word for universe, but they have this phrase, shamayan arrests with the definite articles, used nine times in the Bible, and it always refers to the totality of physical reality. And the word for create means to create something brand new that did not exist before, and actually includes not just all matter and energy, but space and time itself. In fact, the Bible is explicit uh, that God created space and time uh, when he uh, created the universe. Now, I was studying the Bible for the first time when physicists in Britain were beginning to develop the space-time theorems of general relativity. And today we have over 30 of those theorems. Probably the most well-known is the one by Borde, Vilenkin, and Alan Guth, which states that any universe that expands on average has a space-time beginning, which implies a causal agent outside of space and time who creates space, time, matter, and energy. Now, these individuals actually came up with models of the universe that did not have the space-time beginning, but every one of them was a model that would not permit the existence of physical life. Physical life requires a universe that expands on average uh, from its beginning. And Alexander Vilenkin, who himself is not a theist, wrote in a book a couple years later about this theorem, and he said, quote, with the proof now in place, cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is no escape. 
they have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. And the problem he was referring to was the proof of a space-time beginning implies a causal agent beyond space and time who creates our universe of space, time, matter, and energy. And that is your definition of the God that we see described in the Bible. Or as many physicists have pointed out, some kind of God therefore must exist. Even Lawrence Krauss in his book, A Universe from Nothing, uh, concedes that deism is something that cannot be taken off the scientific table because of the force of these space-time theorems. And what I've noticed in the scientific literature with physicists and astronomers who take a non-theistic worldview, the debate is no longer about the existence of God, but whether or not the God that created matter, energy, space, and time is a personal God. So Stephen Hawking denies it, Roger, uh, pardon me, uh, Lawrence Krauss denies it. Uh, so deism, but not theism. So it raises the question, this God that created matter, energy, space, and time, is this God personal? And did he design the universe and the earth for the sake of human beings? Well, what impressed me when I first began to look at the Bible at age 17, as much as it said about the beginning of the universe, it actually says much more about the expansion of the universe. You won't find it in Genesis, but you will find it in the oldest book of the Bible. There's good textual evidence that the book of Job uh, predates the content of the book of Genesis. And it's in Job 9.8 where it says God alone expands the universe, or as some translations put it out, he stretches out the heavens. And these are the texts that actually use the Hebrew verb nata, which means expansion. And I've actually debated Michael Shermer of the Skeptics Society uh, four times on university campuses. This subject always comes up, and his comment is, Hugh, these are not literally talking about the expansion of the universe. They're figurative texts. But I was able to respond and say, if you actually look at these 11 texts, the verb nata shows up in all three Hebrew verb forms, which means it literally is speaking about the continual expansion of the universe. And it's not just me, a 21st century astronomer, who's reading this into the text. Jewish theologians centuries ago also saw this in the text. This is significant because no book outside of the Bible even hinted that we live in a continuously expanding universe until the 20th century. That is, the Bible stood alone for more than 2,500 years as being the one text that says one characteristic of the universe is that it continuously expands from a space-time beginning. Now, I've written an entire book, The Creator and the Cosmos, laying out the most compelling scientific evidence that indeed we live in a continuously expanding universe. I don't have time tonight to give you the best evidence, but I will give you one visual demonstration. Thanks to the Hubble Space Telescope, what you see in the left are galaxies located 12 billion light years away, which means we're seeing them as they were 12 billion years ago. Contrasted with another part of the universe, we're looking at galaxies 2 billion light years away, seeing them as they were 2 billion years ago. And I put both of these images to the same spatial scale. So you notice that 12 billion years ago, galaxies are jammed so tightly together, they're tearing spiral arms off one another. Whereas we move forward another 10 billion years, the galaxies have expanded far enough apart from one another where this phenomena is now rare. And again, if you go on NASA's website, you can see dozens of images that demonstrate uh, this photo album history of the universe demonstrating that indeed it continuously expands. And only in a continuously expanding universe is even physical life possible. Seven places in the Bible it tells us the laws of physics don't change. Jeremiah 33, God says of the Jews, you change your mind all the time. I'm a God that never changes. As evidence that I never change, look at the laws I created that govern the heavens and the earth. As they don't change, I don't change. And this is something we astronomers have now been able to confirm, literally to 16 places of the decimal. We measure the laws of physics in distant stars and galaxies. They measure to be exactly the same as we measure in the lab today. 
And one of those laws uh, is this pervasive law of decay. Ecclesiastes speaks about this. Several books of the Bible uh, discuss this. Romans 8 says the entire creation, all of creation, is subject to this bondage of decay. Now, I did a Veritas forum several years ago at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and we had a panel of uh, science professors uh, respond to my message. And the physics professor said, I want to see uh, a biblical prediction of a future scientific discovery where I can test it with real measurements and numbers. And so this is what we presented. Say, okay, we have the Bible saying the universe has a singularity beginning of space and time, continuously expands from that beginning under a pervasive law of decay that never changes, which means the universe, according to the Bible, will cool down in a highly predictable way. It's the same principle of your car engine. When the piston chamber expands, the temperature goes down and the gasoline stops burning. Well, that principle applies to everything in the universe. So as the universe expands, it gets colder and colder. But we astronomers can now actually measure the past temperature of the universe. And this is what it looks like. And what I've done there is actually put actual measurements we astronomers have made of the past temperature of the universe, overlaying it with the biblically predicted cooling curve for the universe, understanding that the age of the universe is 13.79 billion years. And what you see is how perfectly uh, the measurements fit the biblically predicted curve. And today we actually know what's most responsible for this continual expansion of the universe. It's dark energy. Now the mass of the universe is also a factor, but today dark energy is the most dominant component uh, governing the continual expansion of the universe. Discovered in 1999, uh, we now know it makes up about 71% of all the stuff of the universe. And the way dark energy works <coughs> is that um, if you've got more, it causes the universe to expand more rapidly, and if you've got less, it causes it to expand uh, less uh, rapidly. And it must be fine-tuned, because if you expand the universe too quickly from the cosmic creation event, gravity will not be able to collect the primordial gas of the universe and condense it into galaxies, stars, and planets, and life would be impossible. On the other hand, uh, if you have the universe expanding too slowly from the cosmic creation event, then gravity will collect all that primordial gas and compress it into nothing but black holes and neutron stars, where the density exceeds two billion tons per level teaspoonful, a density so extreme that molecules are impossible, atoms are impossible, even electrons and protons are impossible, and of course, life is impossible. And what astronomers have done is actually determine the degree to which dark energy must be fine-tuned to make possible the existence of life. And the answer is it has to be fine-tuned to one part in 10 to the 122nd power. That's 122 zeros after the one. And to put that in context, there's only 10 to the 79 protons and neutrons in the entirety of the observable universe. And what we've done at Reasons to Believe is try to give you a comparison to understand the philosophical significance of this extreme fine-tuning by comparing the degree of fine-tuning design we see in dark energy to make possible the existence of life with the very best example of human inventiveness, creativity, and engineering design. And my peers would, would agree with me that the best example, most likely, is the gravity wave telescope, the LIGO instrument that's operating in the state of Washington and the state of Louisiana that was responsible uh, for being able to de actually detect gravity waves a couple of years ago. If we compare the very best example of human fine-tuning design uh, to the fine-tuning design we see in dark energy, we notice that our best human achievement ranks 10 to the 97 times inferior, which allows us to draw some conclusions about this causal agent beyond matter, energy, space, and time. That at a minimum, this causal agent is 10 to the 97 times 
That is 10 trillion 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 times more intelligent and more knowledgeable than the Caltech and MIT physicists who invented this thing and designed it. Now, I was on the Caltech faculty for five years. These individuals are not dumb. They're brilliant and they're highly knowledgeable, but nowhere near as brilliant and knowledgeable as the one that designed uh, this dark energy to make our existence possible. Or I could put it another way, uh, the one that designed this dark energy for our benefit is at least 10 to the 97 times better funded than the US government <laughs> that made the construction of these amazing instruments uh, possible. And I think you can get where I'm going with this. We're not just talking a deistic creator, we're talking a theistic creator because the attributes of intellect, knowledge, creativity, and power are attributes that only a personal being can manifest. So this is a scientific way we can establish uh, that indeed <clears throat> we need a creator who's not just able to create space, time, matter, and energy, but one who's able to be personal in fine-tuning the universe for our existence. Now, I think you would expect that someone like myself uh, who is a, a Christian astrophysicist would be moved to draw these conclusions. What's interesting, it's also being drawn by theoretical physicists uh, who are committed atheists. And I've got the research paper in my briefcase, but let me just pull you a couple of quotes uh, from these three astrophysicists uh, who have written on this subject. And when they published their paper, <clears throat> it caught the attention of Philip Ball, uh, who's the physics editor for the British journal Nature and himself an atheist. He interviewed these three theoretical physicists about what they wrote concerning dark energy. Here's one of the quotes uh, in the interview. Arranging the universe as we think it is arranged, that is with dark energy, says the team, would have required a miracle. And here's a second quote from the article. An unknown agent, namely beyond space and time, intervene in the evolution that is the history of the universe for reasons of its own, which explains the title they put on their paper, Disturbing Implications of a Cosmological Constant, which is another term for dark energy. As atheist theoretical physicists, they said if dark energy is real, it implies there must be this agent beyond space and time performing miracles for reasons of his own, and hence we find that very disturbing. And they wound up concluding their research paper with this final sentence, perhaps the only reasonable conclusion is that we do not live in a universe with a true cosmological constant. They concluded their paper by saying, dark energy cannot be true. Because if it's true, it implies this agent performing miracles for reasons of his own. Now the irony of this research paper is that it was published just months before astronomers came up with nine independent observational demonstrations that not only is dark energy real, it's the dominant component of the universe. And I've written like a two-page article on each of these nine demonstrations. You'll find them on our reasons.org website, and it's based on the following astronomical observations, galaxy cluster x-rays, maps of the cosmic background radiation. I won't go into all of this, but there's a URL there uh, which actually takes you to those articles and takes you to 16 more, because today we have 25 independent astronomical demonstrations that dark energy is real and the dominant component of the universe, which means we really are stuck with an agent beyond space and time, performing miracles for reasons of his own. Now, if you were to ask me as a scientist, where do you think we find the most spectacular measurable evidence for fine-tuning design? I would say dark energy. But it's not the only one. There are hundreds of others. And so, for example, you'll find on our website articles giving similar examples of this extraordinary level of fine-tuning design. So for example, for light to be possible, you have to fine-tune the ratio of the gravitational force to the electromagnetic force uh, to better than one part in 10,000 trillion trillion trillion. Otherwise, no life uh, is possible. In fact, stars, stable stars, wouldn't be possible. 
and the list goes on. And you can go to reasons.org slash fine tuning. It'll pop up for a compendium which lists these and it actually gives you uh, citations of the scientific literature where you can read the research papers for yourself. But here's how we can put our biblical creation model to the test. If this is really evidence for the God of the Bible, the Bible tells us the more we learn about nature, the more we'll see evidence for the supernatural handiwork of God. And so what our scientific team did starting in 1991 was to survey the scientific literature and say, okay, where do we see this scientific evidence? Then we did that every year thereafter. And this table here demonstrates indeed how the list of these extraordinarily fine-tuned features of the universe and the laws of physics grew with respect to time. So in 1991, 17, we were able to discern from the scientific literature. Today, the list is well over 200 of these features. And again, you can see the documentation at reasons.org slash fine tuning. Now, that's where typically the literature on the fine tuning design for the benefit of life and the secular literature stops. They simply look at the universe as a whole. What our scientific team had reasons to believe has done is say, okay, we see it at the level of the whole universe. We're probably also going to see it at lower size scales. So looking at the cluster of galaxies, our galaxy, our star, and what we discovered is you don't need just a highly fine-tuned universe. You have to have a highly fine-tuned cluster of galaxies. Tens of thousands of clusters of galaxies, but only one do we see has the fine-tuned features that would make uh, life uh, possible, and we happen to be living in that galaxy cluster. Our Milky Way galaxy is two, 200 features plus that must be fine-tuned uh, to make our existence possible. You need a just right star. We now know that every planet in our solar system must be fine-tuned. Even Mercury and Mars must be fine-tuned uh, to make uh, human life possible here on planet Earth. And of course, our planet must be fine-tuned. 22 different features of our moon must be fine-tuned. And we did the same thing with the galaxy and the solar system that we did with the universe. Starting in 1995, surveying the scientific literature, we found 41 different features that show this extraordinary level of fine-tuning design, meaning that if the, even if the universe contained a trillion trillion planets, the probability of finding one without invoking divine miraculous interventions that would make primitive life possible, bacterial life possible, less than one chance in 10 to the 31st power. But notice how that probability has become progressively more remote with respect to time. So at the end of 2006, the probability that you could find a body in the universe that would be able to sustain bacteria less than one chance in 10 to the 556th power. Now, if you look at that last column, what you notice is that the more we learn about the universe and our Milky Way galaxy and planetary system with respect to time, indeed, the stronger the scientific case becomes for the supernatural handiwork of the creator, and it becomes stronger at a minimum of a factor of 1,000 times per month. So when I speak on university campuses to skeptics, I'll say, if you're not convinced today, wait one month and read the scientific literature and see which way it goes. And again, it's not just me making this point. Numbers of physicists who are not Christians like I am also draw the same conclusion. For example, we got Freeman Dyson uh, saying in his book, Disturbing the Universe, the more I examine the universe, the more evidence I find that the universe in some sense must have known we were coming. Now, I've only got a couple of minutes left. What I want to share with you is that we've written several books on this subject. Probably the one that's most lay accessible is why the universe is the way it is. I think we have it out there on the table. Uh, but the latest one is Improbable Planet, which makes the point that we see enormously greater fine-tuning design evidence for human beings than we do for bacteria, literally by a factor of 10 to the 600 times or more. But the greatest jump we see is not just to have a planet in which humans can exist, 
but a planet in which billions of humans can exist at one time and develop the technology where this kind of news about the creator and his desire to form a redemptive relationship with us can be spread in a relatively short period of time. And the conclusion I draw on Improbable Planet, literally every component of the universe, Earth and Earth's life, plays a critical role in being fine-tuned design to make possible the existence of billions of human beings with technology uh, on this uh, planet within uh, the universe. So you can check that out, and uh, thank you for listening. Well, thank you, Dr. Ross, for a um, very inspiring talk on cosmology. I love the topic, so um, just want to thank you for that talk. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Joshua Swamidas. Dr. Swamidas received both his MD and his PhD from the University of California, Irvine. His research focuses on computational methods to solve problems at the intersection of medicine, chem chemistry, and biology. Those are all your favorite topics, right? <laughs> There's no physics in there. What happened? Um, he blogs at peacefulscience.org, finding confident faith in a scientific world. So let's thank um, Dr. Swamidas. I'm just going to get it set up with the computer here. There we go. So I was asked to respond to uh, our human special, but following that show, um, I also was thinking a lot about Hugh Ross. Uh, I don't know if you know, but he is, uh, he's a very significant person in this conversation, and it's a real honor to be here. Most of my, what my talk is gonna be how we're focused on this question about our human special. And, and Hugh Ross comes to this from the point of view as an astrophysicist. I come at it from the point of view of a biologist, a physician, and also as a Christian, as he does too. And I have to tell you, as I was thinking about this question over the last few weeks, uh, there's two photos that I wanted to show you that just came to mind over and over and again, okay? Here's the first one. <laughs> you can recognize someone there, right? <laughs> it's Hugh Ross, it's me, and it's James Tor. James Tor is another uh, good friend of mine here. And so when I think about humans being special, I think in one sense, that's just self-evidently true. Humans are special. I and mean, these are actually two people that are special to me. And I explain to you why. I'm a Christian, but I'm a very, I'm a bit of a different sort of Christian than Hugh Ross. I'm, I'm a Christian that affirms evolution. I believe that's how God created us. And uh, for reasons that I have a hard time understanding all the time, uh, this is a very contentious issue among Christians. And if you're not a Christian, you might have a hard time understanding it too. I certainly do. Um, Hugh doesn't affirm that. There's a lot of people that really respect him. But one thing that I found out about him that has just endeared me to him in a way that's, that's hard to explain, I'll try right now, is that he, he's treated me with respect as a, as a family member <laughs> and never, uh, had never been unkind to me. And even when he's found people or, or heard of situations where people haven't treated me well, he's actually stood up for me. It's, it's, it, he's one of those people that even though at times we're at different sides, there's real disagreements, we might even see some disagreements come out today, I'll tell you that, that I, ha I have a love for him. <laughs> he's a person who's really special to me. If it was James Torres talking about it, I'd be able to tell you the same things about him. We sit on se separate sides of the conversation too. But I'll say that, that for all of our differences, that we are, uh, all three of us are scientists in the church and Christians in science, and we found the commonality there. And, and, and there's something special about that, and I don't think anyone can plausibly deny that specialness of these, these people here. Or, and, and more than that, you have that experience, too. There are people that are special to you, so clearly humans are special. And if you were here yesterday, you'll remember that um, I'm going through a, a time of grief right now. My, uh, my father unexpectedly died of a heart attack on Saturday night. And uh, there was questions about whether or not I'd even be here today. And, uh, you know, there's this thing where you have a plane you're going on and you get blindsided by something unexpected. Uh, he, it was just suddenly, I mean, and it's had me deeply in thought. And um, one of 
the pictures that I, I'm constantly uh, thinking about for a reason uh, that is obvious but not controllable is, is this picture. It's the last time I saw my father with my son. So it's three generations of Swami Dai. That's the plural form. <laughs> And Caleb is two years old, and he was just enjoying and just loving, you know, throwing bread out to the ducks. <laughs> and yeah, my father is special to me. Are humans special? Of course they are. Is, is Caleb special? Of course he is. Now, I know, I know what some people are thinking here, but wait a minute, this is skirting the question. And in a sense, you're right, because we're trying to figure out, is there something distinctly special beyond just like what the value that we assign to it. I think a good way of rephrasing the question is this. Are we special to anyone greater than us? So yes, my father is special to me, but I'm not actually greater than my father. I'm certainly not greater than Hugh Ross. <laughs> but is there anything that Hugh Ross and my father and me, is there anyone greater than us, like truly greater than us to whom we're special? I think that's a fundamental question, and I think it's a better question than asking, is there something special about our abilities? Because when you get right down to it, yeah, we, it's also self-evident that humans have special abilities in many ways compared to the animal kingdom, and people will get hung up on that, especially if, uh, as a biologist, that's often what I'm pegged to talk about, and we talked about that a little bit yesterday. But ultimately, I think humans are special in a way that's independent of our abilities. Think about that for a moment. I believe that if my son gets injured in an accident and loses his mental capacity, he's still special. That there's still something different about him that I'm going to place higher value in that. And I also believe, oh, my answer to this, is that maybe there is someone greater than even me who places value in him, even if he doesn't have ability. Like our value... My value, his value, is not defined by his abilities. So yeah, even though humans do have different abilities, I don't know if that's really what makes us ultimately most special. So I'm a scientist, though, and for me, I was raised as a Christian, but that wasn't enough for me. I wasn't going to follow my parents' faith. I had to really see, you know, is there any evidence behind this faith? Because yes, I would say that God thinks that, that we're each individually special, but is that just the story we tell ourselves? Is that just what I was told when I was a child? My parents believe it, and so therefore I believe it. I, I wasn't comfortable with that. And so uh, there's a philosophical term I want to introduce, an epistemological term, which is warrant. I really went through a period where I wanted to know what's the warrant for my faith. So I, was a, I was a junior higher at the time, <laughs> so I didn't know what warrant was. But that's really what it was. It was that search for confidence. That this could be more than something... Uh, that could be best described as a purely man-made religion. Is there anything here that could tell me that there's a God that exists that's good and that wants to be known and, and, and cares about me? And I, I sifted through many things in, in this faith, and I came to one thing that seemed like I could not dismiss as a man-made thing. This is that thing here. It comes from 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 7. I'm going to give you the clearest explanation here and come back to it in a couple different ways. Uh, my summary of this uh, passage is that uh, according to prophecy, Jesus died, he was buried and rose from the dead and was seen by many. And that is how I know but from this act of God in history to reveal himself that God exists, he's good, and wants to be known. According to prophecy, Jesus died, he was buried, he rose from the dead and was seen by many. This act of God in history reveals that God exists, is good, and wants to be known. So this gets to this idea of the resurrection. Christians often talk about Jesus dying on a cross, but that was never enough for me. And, and frankly, that's not even really what the scripture says the gospel is, because many people die. Many people died on crosses. What makes us wonder if there's something more that happened here is the claim that people made at that time that Jesus rose from the dead. I want to, I want to draw your attention to a couple things that I'm going to go deeper onto from a scientific side. First of all, the claim is, to be clear, that Jesus, Jesus was a historical person with a physical body that was crucified. He died, he was executed, and that he physically rose from the dead. I want to be clear that there's no physical mechanism claimed. <laughs> and that this is a place where the laws of physics were broken. Notwithstanding the claim that the laws of physics won't change, this is a place where 
I don't think that there is ever going to be a good account for this from biology as we know it. If I was to tell you the biological conclusion, the conclusion of medical medicine is that if you die, you stay dead. If I put you into a grave for three days, you're not coming out. I cannot foresee a moment where that's going to change. That's what it seems like the way the world works, but that's the point. That's the way the world works. Everyone knows that. Even the ancient world knew that. And that's the place where God chose to do something different, to make it known that he is not subject to the, to the laws that we're subject to. I want to point out that this is not a scientific claim because this is about God's action. It's not about God's, about physics laws or whatever. But it is an evidential claim. What I would say is there's actually a great deal of evidence for this. And the first time I really discovered this is uh, when I read More Than a Carpenter by Josh McDowell. But then later on, I was reading um, Pascal. This is in high school. He writes this. He says, there's those that have claimed to know God and prove him without Jesus Christ. They have had only weak proofs. But in proof of Jesus Christ, we have prophecies, which are solid and palpable proofs. And I know this is a sensitive issue, and I have a great deal of respect for Hugh. He has had a real role in my life personally, which is really special because I actually remember reading his book for the first time uh, in high school, actually, too, and it had an impact on me. You know, I, I, I think so much of what he says I agree with, but in the end, I'm left feeling like there's something missing. And what that piece is that's missing for me, is the proof that I find in the resurrection that I don't see as clearly other places. Now, I don't, I don't disagree with many of the things that he said, but if that's the case, you know, most of my colleagues are not Christians. There's something, there's nothing in science that gives me to a clear belief that God exists and that it's Jesus. I have to look elsewhere, and I think what's going on here is that the God that I find through Jesus is a God that we can't really fully get to on our own. It really requires him to reach down to us. And if you saw how large and vast the universe is and how old it is, this is a very vast God. He's a God that's grander than anything we can imagine. The idea that we could reach him on our own effort is actually preposterous. The only way we'd expect that God to be reachable by us is if he reached down to us. And I think the way he did it is this. And Pascal um, mentions prophecies as a key evidential piece of this. And I would say that the evidence for this has only increased. So this is an example of this. I'd encourage you to read all of Isaiah 52 if you're curious. It starts a little bit before. It's 52 to 53. I have the exact verses there. But, uh, but uh, this is a passage that was written about 400 years before Jesus was on earth. And he says that he was going to grow up. This person, the servant of the Lord, is going to grow up before us like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry, dry ground. He was going to be led like a lamb to the slaughter. He'd be assigned to grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. If you read the actual gospel accounts, you know exactly what that means. That ends up being fulfilled to the T. And he suffered. And after he suffered, he'll see the light of life and be satisfied. This is a prediction of the death and resurrection of Jesus. This I see as evidence of an intelligence beyond our time reaching into our story, letting us know that he exists. Because he knows something's going to happen in the future and he's giving us all the evidence we need to be able to recognize it when it comes. Now, in your Bibles, you'll see this little footnote that I've put here too. And it's hung up on this word, the light of life. And it says the Dead Sea Scrolls and also the Septuagint, these are two ancient texts, have light of life. But the Masoretic text does not. And you might wonder what's going on there. Well, what's going on there is that for a long time, we're talking about for close to 2,000 years, uh, people who did not believe in the resurrection would say, well, you know, that whole light of life thing, that was added by Christians later on as a post-diction to make it seem like the Bible predicted Jesus was right from the dead, but it never really did. They're not being honest with you. To some extent, we knew that wasn't exactly right because the Septuagint was from before that time, and it includes that, that terminology too. But we never didn't really have the original text, so we didn't know until our parents' generation, 2,000 years go by, and we discovered this. This is the great Isaiah school, scroll. It was discovered in a pot in a cave in Palestine. Isn't that crazy? It's just been sitting there for 2,000 years, and it comes available. And this is made out of, of a material that has carbon in it. It turns out that we can date things with carbon. And we can also ask, is that word there? And when you can look at the text and we can find out in this version of Isaiah, it includes the word light of life. 
You can actually do carbon dating on it. This is the paper that does it. You can see there where I circled in red, that is the date, the black line is the date at which it dates the Great Isaiah Scroll. And the dash boxes is how you date it with, uh, with based on the, the shape of the script. It turns out that that's a way to actually date it too, and, you, and it's actually consistent. And we can see it's about 200 years previous to when Jesus comes. Isn't that interesting? It means we have scientific evidence that this is a prophecy that was made before Jesus came. Once again, I would say that this is evidence. Now, maybe we don't agree with it. Maybe we ultimately come to a different conclusion, but this is evidence of an intelligence beyond our time reaching out to us. Now, I'm a physician, too. I'm not just a scientist. I'm also a physician. One of the more puzzling features of the narratives you see in Genesis, and these are eyewitness accounts, and this is one reason, well, uh, at least they're derived from eyewitness accounts is a better way to put it. One evidence of that, there's like these weird features that don't make sense in the ancient world that they would say it this way, but now it actually makes a bit more sense. So what they say is that when, that when Jesus was on the cross, he didn't die in the normal way. Usually people die one way, but he didn't die that way. He ended up being stabbed with a spear, and that water and blood came out. And that's a very puzzling thing. And there's this paper that was written, and it was actually published in JAMA, which is one of the leading, uh, one of the leading uh, 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 medical journals. And they actually looked at that question of what is actually going on? What actually happened during the physical death of Jesus when you actually look at those accounts and make a sense of it with medical science? And one of the things that they noted was how is it that there could have actually been water and blood that came out? It turns out that that is a very bizarre thing. It's not normal that would happen in any case. And what they think happened is that the spear went in and that there was an abnormal amount of fluid that was collecting around his heart or his lungs and when it pierced that, that water came out and also blood came out. And, that, and the thing about it is if a wound like that happened, well, you would be certain that a person was dead. There's no way to be, be stabbed through your heart and live. Secondly, the people at that time had no idea that that's the case. Because if you stab most people in the heart, you only get blood. What was going on is this is a very unique situation where it's not normal, but what happened is there was a lot of, of fluid that collected there and it was water that came out, then blood. And the people seeing this noticed that. They thought it was weird. And so they wrote about it, but they didn't know what it meant. Now, from our point of view, understand how the body works, now it makes a bit more sense. It, it makes sense as people just trying to accurately represent what they saw the best they could. And that this is actually something we can understand as pretty clear evidence that he really died. Of course, many people die. How do we know he rose from the dead? And, and to be honest, when people who are Christians come to me and want to know the clear evidence for evolution, I'll tell them a few things. But honestly, the truthful answer is that there's just so much out there that's involved that you, if you really want to know, you need to spend some time and devote yourself to, to really getting to the truth of this and not trust what people say about it, but actually look at it for yourself. And I'd say that something is true about that here. The first place I'd point you, if, you, if you're questioning what I'm saying, you want to know, is that really true what he's saying? Is there really evidence for the resurrection? I would actually start by looking at what the historical accounts are in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read them just asking, could this be a truthful account? Then I'd point you to Josh McDowell, who I'll call the regular guy. <laughs> uh, that's a very accessible book. I read it when I was in junior high. Where he really lays out why it is that he came when he looked into this to really conclude that there was a reason to believe that God revealed himself through, by raising this person, Jesus, from the dead. But there's a couple other places I'd point you to for those that really want to go into this. You want more than a ch children's story. One is, uh, Did the Resurrection Happen? by Gary Habermas and Anthony Flew. And I, I want to tell you something about this. So Gary Habermas, this is his academic effort. He's a history professor. And during the 80s or so, I might get the dates wrong here, because I'm not a historian. But he, uh, he, as people were really looking at what, who's this historical Jesus, Gary and his academic work really looked into it to really clarify what is it that we actually get from the historical record. And he actually makes a case that doesn't even rely on scripture or a holy book to make the sense the case that there's a couple key facts that every historian agrees to happened in first century Palestine. And the grand question we're faced, something happened then, what is it? He had a debate with Antony Flew. I think this book is really helpful and really clarifying what's going on here. What is the questions at stake? Why is it that so many academics are convinced that something extraordinary happened there? There's also N.T. Wright I'd point you to. He wrote a book that's phenomenal, it's 800 pages long. Once again, this is an academic piece of work. It gets into the what's actually going at that time, all the negative controls of what's going on, how did people at that time see death, how are they talking, they're really making this claim. 
If you want to go here, this is something you could lose yourself in and actually make your entire career on studying. This is deep. I can't give you a full summary except to say there's an immense amount of evidence that points that direction. It really invites us to wonder if this is how God revealed himself to all people. Now, I know what, there's a question going on around in the back of many people. If humans are special, is, are humans really special, though, if, if evolution is true? And I'll tell you, absolutely, none of what I've said changes if evolution is true or false. And I'll point to a couple things. I'm not the only Christian that came to experience this presence of Jesus that's a living presence that's connected to that. I mean, I would even go far to say, though I didn't see the physical body of Jesus like the original disciples claimed to have, I have seen a presence in this world that, I, that, that makes sense with this. There's others, too. So Francis Collins is the head of the NIH. She's one of the leading biologists. So most biologists are uh, sometimes antagonistic to Christians, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, Dr. Collins affirms evolution, and uh, he, when he wrote this book, a lot of Christians were uncomfortable about how he talked about, uh, about evolution, maybe in some of the way how some of the Christians are uncomfortable about how I'm talking about it now. But half of his book is actually more written to his colleagues, explaining how he came to faith. And like most scientists, he came to faith as he encountered Jesus. And there was nothing in evolution that dimmed the light of Jesus. I'd also point you to Praveen Setupathi. Um, he's a good friend of mine. Maybe you can invite him back next year. You may invite him here next year. He's a Cornell geneticist. He's Indian. Uh, I was raised Christian, uh, and I'm Indian. He's Indian, and he was raised Hindu. And he came to encounter the same Jesus that I found. That's what's so remarkable about this, is that, you know, it's not like I'm pre-programmed this way. I find people with so many different backgrounds that all come to the same place. And some people are still wondering, but did God specially create humans independent of evolution? And this is where things get really interesting. And if this is something that's a question that's important to you, I'd encourage you to come to the talk tomorrow at 10 a.m. One thing that's really important to scientists is not just understanding what the evidence tells us, but if you talk to scientists, we're really also wanting to clarify what the evidence doesn't tell us. And while it really seems that our ancestors never dipped down to a single couple, and it really seems that we share an ancestry with the, with the great apes, and I'll even show you some of the evidence for that tomorrow, at the same time, we have to ask what type of ancestry is really important from a theological point of view. Is it genetic ancestry, even though the Bible never mentions DNA? Or is it genealogical ancestry? And when you start to reframe the questions in that sense, looking at genealogical ancestry, well, you find out that there's no evidence against, or for, but there's no evidence in science or in genetics or archaeology against the notion that Adam and Eve were specially created from the dust in a rib 10,000 years ago in Mesopotamia in a divinely created garden where they fell and started, and their offspring interbred with the surrounding population, and thereby they became the, the descendants of all of us. All that really modern science presses on theology, it seems, is by telling us the story of the people outside the garden. I find that really interesting. <laughs> and I can't get into it now, but I'll just say that science tells us the story about the population. It doesn't tell us the story about all the individuals. It tells us the story of the entire race of humans, but it doesn't tell the story of me, my father, and my son. And in the end, it's not usually in the grand generalities that you find meaning. It's usually in, in the personal stories, the stories that I can't even tell you because they're too personal about my father and my son. So yeah, humans are special. I think we know that. I think the hard part is sometimes articulating why, but humans are special, we know that. And I hope the way I put words to it makes some sense. I, I think that there's someone greater than us that thinks we're special too. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you, Dr. Swamidas. At this point, I would like to invite both of our speakers to come out, and um, we'll have a little bit of a dialogue between them. And uh, you can text in your questions. It looks like people already are, so that's a good sign, um, to the slido.com address. Well, lots and lots of interesting thoughts. <laughs> 
And different perspectives, certainly coming from um, the two different fields that you work in. Um, one, one thing that came to mind for me, Josh, is, um, is there evidence for fine tuning that Dr. Ross has talked about in evolutionary biology? Well, first of all, I would say about the fine tuning argument, I agree actually with a lot of what he has said. A lot of the particulars isn't precisely my area. Uh, some people dispute details, but I think the general picture is true. I think most people say that there's something very peculiar about our universe. I think um, maybe the place where we're in different places on it is, I think that that's most convincing to people who've already encountered that presence. So I think it's most convincing to people who are already Christians or are already theists, um, even though I'm not really sure if I can equate those things. I think it's not as convincing for people who are already starting from a point of view of not really getting there. It, maybe it raises a question, but it doesn't give the answer. Um, and so, well, I don't disagree. Well, I, I, the way I would frame it is it's not so much an argument for God, but it's, it's definitely something that makes sense if there is a God and, in and a different way that should be very comforting to people who believe there's a God, because the world certainly makes sense in light of Jesus. How, how, how would you put that? Yeah, my experience is quite different because I wasn't raised in a Christian home, and the fine-tuning argument had a big impact on my realizing that there's a Christian God behind the universe. And I've also seen many research scientists from a non-theistic background similarly respond positively and consequently uh, come to faith in Christ. So. Uh, yeah, I don't I mean, think it's just an impact on people who are Christians. I see it having a huge impact on people who have had little or no exposure to the Christian faith. Yeah, and you know, maybe it is the difference between astrophysics and biology, too. So maybe the biologists just don't have enough uh, first-hand experience of what you're talking about. Well, I could put it this way. It's easier to see the fine-tuning design in the simple sciences than it is to see it in the more complex sciences. So, for example, when I'm gauging biologists, I'll talk about, say, the physics of the sun and the moon and the earth, how it changes with time, and how that impacts what we see happening in biology. So kind of start with the simple sciences where the fine-tuning design, I think, is really obvious, and then move them step by step uh, where they can see it in the more complex sciences. Yeah, I mean, so to be clear, I mean, I, I have a great deal of respect for, for you I mean, I, I guess I just found Jesus more compelling in the end for me. I mean, mm -hmm. to be clear, I, I found a lot very compelling about fine-tuning. And I, and I think a lot of people would agree fine-tuning is among the best arguments for the existence of, of God. Yeah, and Josh, I'm not disputing what you're saying about yeah. the resurrection. I would argue that is the best apologetic argument for the Christian faith. My experience in dealing with uh, non-Christian Americans and Europeans, for example, is we need to start with something that's current and bring them to the traditional. So kind of what we do at Reasons to Believe is we take the latest new scientific evidences uh, for the God of the Bible and use that as a bridge to bring them to the traditional evidences. Because if I bring up the resurrection, it's like, hey, that's 2,000 years ago. I want to talk about what's happening. And so we need to find a bridge to bring them to the evidence that they may not initially be willing to listen to. Yeah, that's interesting. Maybe it is a context difference. So, so, yeah. um, so I, I can, I can, I mean, clearly. Well, let me just say, I don't think you're misrepresenting what you're saying. I really believe that. I guess I would just say that I've also seen. I mean, it is a different context, too, among biologists. Like, like you said, it's not as clear the fine tuning in biology, and I would agree with that. I, I, I would also say that. Um, I just found a lot of scientists that are really curious about Jesus, and they actually are very much interested in starting there. Well, if they're interested in starting there, great, that's where you go. <laughs> uh, but there are a lot of scientists who aren't ready to go there, so I need to find a bridge to get them there. And Maybe so, we're not that far apart. No, we're not. <laughs> that's I mean, interesting. you basically pick up people where they are. If, they wanna, if they're willing to talk about Jesus and the resurrection, go for it. If they're not there yet, I need to find some way to get them there. Well, yeah, to get I... to your question about fine-tuning, is, uh -huh. is that what you want to do, or do you want to go to the next question? Uh, let's go to the next question. Sure. Because you can bring up fine-tuning again. Um, there's actually two ways that, um, two types of fine-tuning. And one is those constants that determine the laws of physics, such as, you know, the strength of gravity or right. the the electronic bonds that determine you know, how the atom is formed, right. those things. And the second is in random processes. 
And so, you know, there's billions of suns out there, and this one happens to be special to us. And, um, you know, but there's, there's this sort of sense of there's a lot of random choices where that sun could have resulted in the universe. And um, yet you use the word fine tuning for that process as well. And so I'd, I'd like to understand how fine tuning uh, applies in a random process. Yeah, kind of the way I phrase it is with the universe, <clears throat> we got a measurable sample size of one. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas, say, with stars, we got a measurable sample size right. of a trillion trillion. And so you can look at all those stars and say, okay, based on what we see here, uh, what is a probabilistic argument we can draw? So it's like, okay, what's the fine tuning compared to the known population size? And what impresses me, I think I tried to do this in my talk, whatever size scale we choose to examine, we see overwhelming evidence for this fine tuning design. I stopped at the Earth and the Moon, right. but we could have gone all the way down to your specialty, particle physics. <laughs> and no matter how it's big you go or how small you go, you see that fine tuning design. So every size scale you look, it's there. So that's another, <clears throat> maybe you could jump in. So just to be clear the about side, the right? imbalance here, like Hugh Ross <laughs> is like famous for this, uh, the fine tuning argument. <laughs> So that's my situation here, to be clear. Oh. <laughs> but so you say it's not but, a fair one, huh? But uh, yes, it's not. But, I, but I'll say, like, I mean, I, I'm sympathetic to the argument because I believe that God created the universe, all right? Um, but I'm also sympathetic to the atheist that isn't convinced. Um, so I know the counter arguments. And I, I, think, I think what you're saying is correct. However, I can see other ways of saying it that I can't evidentially rule out. I can't evidentially rule them in either. Yeah. So I, I guess I'm sympathetic to the atheist that isn't convinced on that. Um, so, and I, and I think I know how you're gonna respond to them. And I'm not, I'm not even gonna defend these because I'm not even saying that these are the correct points of view, but I think there is an internal logic to them that I'm sympathetic to. So one is like, we don't even really know how many trials there are in this universe. We talk about the size of the universe being the observable universe. Even in this universe, I'm not saying it's infinite, we don't have to go that far, but it could be really, really big, like much bigger than what we observe. Right. And that starts to make it actually consistent with the fact that we don't see, if it was like very unlikely and we saw a whole bunch of like human livable planets in a very close area, that would be evidence that God fine-tuned it in a way so that there'd be a whole bunch of ways for us to be interstellar or something, right? But the fact that we only see one Earth, one place, and then complete desolate place that's inhospitable to humans seems to be very consistent with the notion that this is a very random event, and maybe we just calculated the size of the universe wrong, and that completely actually makes sense given what we know with cosmology because it could, there could be much larger beyond that. Now, I know I'm talking, not, I'm talking about things beyond the evidence here, and I, understand, and I think they are too, so I don't think they can use that as a defeater for your argument, well, but it, I don't think that boxes them in at that point. It does, because one of the characteristics to get a planet like Earth, the universe must be precisely a particular mass and age and size. And so if you made it bigger, you're in trouble. If you make it smaller, you're in trouble. It's gotta be exactly the size, the mass, and the age that it is, just to get one. And there's a debate that's going on amongst Christian astronomers. Uh, is God so compulsively creative that he's going to make lots of planets in which there's life? Now, we all agree that if he's doing it, each case is a supernatural event. Uh, or is his goal to perform as few miracles as he needs to perform to achieve his redemptive purpose? And so there are astronomers who argue, given that theological perspective, God would do it only once, and therefore we'd expect to see hostility everywhere except the earth, and the scientific evidence so far is leaning in that direction, away from the view that, hey, God has done it multiple times. Well, I, well, we I would see, say that actually our, the faith that I find in Jesus is consistent with either view. Right, it is. I would agree but with that. the notion that, that it's a, a random process that produced just the right factors along the right place is only consistent with one of those two. It's only consistent with the notion of a single earth that's hospitable, followed with desolate wasteland. So that actually becomes to be something that is more consistent because like our point of view can go consistent either way. 
And um, so, I mean, I, look, I'm, I, and, I, and I can't actually assess, assess for myself the claims you're making. Maybe you're right, and I would be happy to look at that more, but I'm also a biologist. Well, you're I'm an astrophysicist, so, but I guess I'm sympathetic to the atheist. Well, <laughs> where the atheist has gone, and I remember speaking on this in the early 1980s, basically saying this fine-tuning evidence is becoming so compelling, eventually atheists will have nowhere else to go but to propose an infinite number of universes with an infinite variety of characteristics. But it says they're not going to go there willingly because they recognize that that's the weak philosophical argument. What I notice is they didn't go there until they had nowhere else to go. And, you know, there are very good reasons why this is not a favorable argument. In fact, we talked about it over dinner, how uh, there is both a negative <laughs> refutation and a positive refutation. Well, you know, honestly, I feel like we need to grab a beer afterwards, if you drink, that is. <laughs> but um, I think we're losing the crowds here. Okay. All right. <laughs> I, 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 do, I uh, don't want to go down that rabbit hole too far, because it does seem like you have a lot that you agree about um, as to a personal God and even why we are special maybe to that God. And so um, maybe we can come up with, now I've got to use a cell phone I'm not familiar with. Oh, there it is. Uh, if, uh, it's writing over the words. Um, to some of the student questions. Um, if in the beginning there was nothing, where did God come from? Why would you, uh, uh, why would he not need a beginning? And I guess that's something for both of you to maybe briefly um, respond to. Well, I've actually written books on that subject, so. <laughs> so what's the title you would recommend? <laughs> well, I address that in Why the Universe is the Way It Is, but okay. in three other books as well, and actually had a debate on that at um, Imperial College in London, uh, where that was the sole question of the debate, uh, basically making the point, well, you're making a category <clears throat> error. The universe and all life in the universe is constrained to a single dimension of time. But the space-time theorems tell us that God created time when he created this universe of space and time. So unlike us, he's not constrained in time. Any entity constrained to a single dimension of time that can't be stopped or reversed must have a beginning or some ultimate creation event. But the one that can create space-time dimensions at will is not so constrained. So I was able to explain to Lewis Walpart, and you can watch this for free on uh, YouTube, uh, that if you have a God that can create time dimensions that will, just consider two dimensions of time. In two dimensions of time, you can have an infinite number of timelines running in an infinite number of directions. So you could have God operating in a timeline infinitely long that never crosses or touches the timeline of our universe. As such, he has no beginning, no ending, and is uncreated. And of all the holy books of religions of the world, only the Bible says that. And only the Bible says that God can arbitrarily compress time or expand time, something that's mathematically possible only for a being that has access to at least the equivalent of two dimensions of time. And Lewis said, hey, uh, I've never heard that before, and that really makes sense. So. Well, I would just say that um like a simpler way that I would put it, <laughs> <laughs> is that sometimes people, it comes down to our word, use of the word God. And so God is something that means a lot of different things to different people. So this question is asking, why is it that God doesn't have a beginning? Well, well, I'm not talking about a generic God. We're talking about, actually, Hugh is not talking about a generic God either. I, I don't actually make arguments for theism. I don't even call myself a theist. Um, because I think there's a lot of danger in a belief in a generic God. It causes a lot, a great deal of harm in this world. But what I would say is that the God that I find in Jesus is a God that created all things. He's the thing that doesn't have a cause or a beginning. That's actually the fundamental claim, that everything in this world has a beginning except for that. Now, that's what we're meaning when we're saying God. Something that has the power to create all things has no beginning. And the, the, those, those particulars are not randomly picked out of anywhere. It's because it's through this experience we had by encountering Jesus that we come to those particulars. And it's not, uh, and so, I mean, I, I agree. There's nothing else we can point to that has no cause. And I would argue the space-time theorems establish your very point. Well, that's cool. Now I have some mathematical proof. But, 
No, I'm playing. But, but I'm just saying that, that that's all we're saying. So, I mean, we're not trying to assess any generic God because there's some versions of God that don't make any sense. We all agree with that. And maybe ours doesn't make any sense, but, you, but let's start with what we're actually saying. And we're talking about a God that has no beginning, that has a different quality to himself than everything that was created, and we're generally interacting with things that are created. Well, for example, the gods of Hinduism and Buddhism create within space and time that eternally exists. The God of the Bible creates independent of space and time. Space and time don't exist until he creates. So you're right, we're talking a specific God, the God of the Bible. Well, here's another one, uh, more on the evolution um, question. If evolution is true, at what point did human beings become distinguished as in God's image in the way that our close animal relatives are not? That's a very good question. And the reason why it's important to us is some of the things that I even brought up yesterday when I was talking about injustice in this world and reading about Martin Luther King. In our society, we've come to the point of view that the way how we think about God's image is it's a grounding, a theological grounding for universal rights, universal dignity, it's the reason why we think everyone has value. And so this is something that's very important to people. What I would say is that, um, well, we're talking when those things that are really important to us, we're talking about the world as we see it now. In science, there isn't a clear way to define what human is. There's actually a great deal of debate about that particular term. Uh, we see a smooth transition of forms. So for example, there's a debate even among creationists about whether or not Neanderthals are human or not. Uh, Hugh has a particular view on that, and, and his view is actually pretty valid. I mean, it's not, there's actually scientists that hold that view, so I'm not at all going to hold, say that they're <laughs> wrong. The issue is that it's hard to actually determine from evidence at what that point that is, and to some extent it's arbitrary. And in the same way, it's very hard to determine when the image of God somehow comes upon people, and even what that is. If you look historically at what the image of God is, there's never been agreement among theologians about what that is. There's been a whole wide range. What we say is that there's something transcendent that was put on us and not anyone else, but we don't even really know what it is or how to define it. Honestly, it's very much like one of those grand questions of what is the, the image of God. We're gonna have a large range of views on it. I think as long as we're all agreeing that everyone bears the image of God and everyone has, you know, you know, has, I mean, we're affirming of universal rights and universal dignity and we're not saying that one race is lesser than the other, I think that there's some, there's uh, some space for, for a conversation and diversity and, and, um, and different opinions on that. Well, I think one area where theologians do have some agreement is when you look at Genesis 1, it uses the word bara three times. First, for the universe, that's the physical creation. Creation day five, for the soulish animals. And in creation day six, last of all, for human beings. Basically saying we're different and that we're body, soul, and spirit. And so at a minimum, the image of God means that we are spiritual beings with the capability of engaging in philosophy, theology, and asking questions like, why am I here? Why is the universe here? What is my role and purpose? Is there a God? I mean, the non-human animals on this planet really aren't concerned about the existence of God. That seems to be unique to us. <laughs> yeah, well, so I would agree with you that there are no chimpanzee veritas forms. That's yes. true. And uh, that they're not lost in the question of what does it mean to be an orangutan? <laughs> And uh, yeah, they're not wondering what the ultimate origin of a macaque is, all right? I, I grant you that. But, but, but there's a deeper question here about what actually is the image of God. So yes, we're very different in those regards. Yeah, what I'm saying and is And so there's differences of opinion yeah. among theologians. No, I agree with that. I'm just saying at a minimum, I think that's where there's a consensus. I would argue there's more to the image of God than just that. And that's where I think there's variety of debate. Well, I guess the one place, oh, sorry, this is, oh, sorry, we're, <laughs> yeah, we're going out again. Maybe we're losing Yeah, the yeah. Um, there's, there's another question that's kind of related right. to that. Oh, okay, cool. So let me insert it in here. Is the uni and I think this one's for Hugh. Uh, is the universe tuned for us are we, or are we tuned for the universe? Mm. Yeah, it's tuned for it's us. It's related. <laughs> and it's not just tuned for us. It's tuned for our redemption. And so I think that really makes the point, yeah, it's really focused on us. And the fact that we see that the fine-tuning evidence 
uh, goes exponentially up when you go from bacteria to plants, and exponentially up when you go to animals, and exponentially up when you go to humans, and the greatest exponentiation is humans that can come into a redemptive relationship with a creator. Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so I guess maybe, so I agree that God created us. <coughs> And I think, it's a, I think we could actually say it both ways. We could say we're made for the universe, the universe is made for us. Like, we're, we're compatible. Yeah. We're in the universe. And I, and I agree, though. It's, it's tuned for those things. However, I guess the part where I disagree is not actually in the conclusion. It's, I don't know if science gets us there. I think maybe the difference is that I just don't trust science as much as you. Well, again, we're in different disciplines. Physics is a discipline where we can measure things to 15 or 20 places the decimal. Uh, where we know the systematic errors. My friends in the life sciences are saying, we're envious, we just simply don't have that. And I'm saying, yeah, because you're studying something enormously more complex. Or when I discovered when I became a parent, I can develop differential equations to predict the future behavior of stars, but it doesn't work on my teenage sons. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's a nice warning for me and Caleb. But, um, <laughs> but, you have uh, a two-year-old. That's even yeah, worse. Yeah, a two-year-old. I can't predict him yet. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 guess, I, I guess I'm just in a, in a cot in a place where I'm, I'm actually pretty sympathetic to your point of view. I'm also very sympathetic to where the atheists are coming from this. I actually agree with you ultimately, but I, I, I just don't think... I'm not as convinced science as gets us as far. Um, and, and then what is science? Science is just a human effort to study nature, and I've just found God's effort to reveal himself to just be much more convincing. Maybe in that sense I'm a bit of a revelationist. <laughs> well, I'm encouraged that the biblical text says so repeatedly, look to nature, it will show you the handiwork of God, and how we're all without excuse before God because of how clearly he's revealed himself through nature, which tells me science really will reveal not just the handiwork of God, but his actual personal attributes, and actually it even re re reveals his redemptive plan. Yeah, once again, like, so there, I think there's many ways to study nature. I think one thing that we would agree on, that modern science, as we know it, didn't exist when those words were penned by Paul. Uh, and yet without science, they found enough confidence to face the lions, knowing that their faith, in their faith, they're finding something that's worth trading everything in this world for. Well, I'm a bit and, sympathetic and to the ancient humans. They weren't as urbanized as we are. And it's like when I speak in rural areas of the world, everybody believes in God. As those of us who live in cities where we're isolated from nature, where they haven't seen the Milky Way galaxy, man, I read a paper in science how 60% of the world's population has never seen the Milky Way. Well, so that, that's where we're getting to the thing. So it says in that passage that this has been clear since the beginning. Yes. So I'm actually much more amenable to the notion that when you go out into nature, as many people here at SLO do, that even uh, people who don't believe in God sometimes have a sense that there's something oh, greater, yeah, and that's definitely. kind of built into us. I agree with that. I think right. that's actually what it's talking about, because that's something that's been clear since the beginning. However, modern science is anything but clear. Well, what I do is my not fellow scientists. It's not, really, it's not really that study of nature that Paul could have been referring to because it didn't exist yet. Yeah, I think that lack of clarity is because we can't get them out of their lab. So what I do... When I, <laughs> so, for example, when I was at Caltech, I would actually take my peers out of the Robinson Laboratory in Pasadena, take them up into the high Sierras, and they would have a spiritual experience. Because for the first time, they're actually in contact with nature. Okay, so that, that uh, you know, we actually might agree more than, you know, we thought. Mm -hmm. But I think that's the study of nature that, that Paul is talking about. It is, I agree. Not modern science, per se. Not that modern science is inconsistent with God, because it's studying the, the world that he created. But, but I think he's talking about something that's available since the beginning, something that exists before we find science. Well, I think part of trying to encourage people to become Christians is getting them outside. <laughs> No, look up well, at the sky. Well, that is true, but in SLO we have a coastal fog, which makes astronomy on campus <laughs> rather difficult. Um, there's another question here for Dr. Swamidas. How can you be a Christian that affirms evolution with the lack of transitory fossils in the uh, theory of evolution, uh, 
Is that right? I, I think it's fossil record. Yeah, so, uh, so that's a common argument that's leveled that I believed really strongly um, for a long time. Um, and I, uh, and I, so the, the statement is like, how do you affirm evolution if you don't see transitory fossils? Uh, and, and like, I believed that argument for a long time. I just found that it wasn't nearly as strong as I, I thought. And in fact, I started to actually go look at it for myself and start to see lots of transitory fossils. Um, part of it comes down to an artifact of language. Because if we're gonna see two different types of animals, we're gonna call them different things. And there's no like way to label something 50-50 between two different things. You use one label for it and another label for it. And so just when you look at the taxonomy of animals, there's gonna be a discreteness to it. However, when you start looking into the details, you find that that's actually not a very good model for how biology works, that there's actually a lot more blurriness in the data. And, uh, and with that, it just, you know, a lot of the things that look like they're no transitory fossils, there's actually, there's actually examples that, you know, they really do look like transitory fossils. And it's not nearly as discreet as I'd been led to believe. And I'll tell you, I was, um, I was surprised by that. Um, but I can see why you may not believe me, because it takes a lot of time to get into that and find. I mean, probably the best example to see that is when you look at whale evolution. You can see uh, real clear evidence of transitory fossils. And also the other place where it's really clear is in human evolution. Because it was very recent, we have really good examples of transitory fossils. Now, that being said, I don't actually think that's the strongest evidence. I think the strongest evidence comes from where I ended up spending a lot of my time studying, because there's a mathematical approach to getting at this, which is looking at genetics. I think when the human genome was sequenced when I graduated undergrad in 2000, <laughs> and then the chimpanzee genome was sequenced in 2005 when I was in graduate school, I think, I think that really um, was data that I didn't, I mean, I'm, I'm not really a paleontologist. Well, I'm not a paleontologist. <laughs> I'm not. I don't pretend to be in the same way I don't pretend to be an astrophysicist. But I am a computational biologist. I am trained to study biological information and to assess that. And when I looked at that closely, one thing I can say, maybe evolution isn't true and, and God just created everything de novo, but he did it in a way that looks like evolution. It at least looks that way. And at the very least, and I remember distinctly coming to this conclusion in 2005 when I was actually using a computer program to look at the chimpanzee genome when it first came out. At the very least, God isn't con as concerned about disproving evolution as I am. Because he could have made it really clear. But I think didn't. there's a good reason why it looks the way it does from a creation perspective, the faint sun paradox. You got the sun getting progressively brighter and brighter as nuclear fusion becomes more efficient in the core of the sun. And so this is going to mandate that a God who wants to maintain a planet that has abundant, diverse life for the longest possible period of time so that we humans can be maximally equipped with biodeposits is going to want to have life on planet Earth that keeps in step with the changing physics of the sun. And so I can understand why uh, people who aren't familiar with the astrophysics look at the fossil record and say, it sure looks like there's this smooth transition going on, but that's exactly what you would need from a creationist perspective. And I find interesting what it says in Psalm 104. It's a property of all life to die off, but God recreates and renews the face of the earth, which is exactly what you would need to compensate for the changing physics of the sun. But I don't disagree that the question is, how does he recreate? And so I think we both affirm creation that God's doing. The question is, how does he do it? And this is actually a mechanistic question. And could he use common descent as part of that? And, well, and so it, what I'm saying isn't actually inconsistent with that passage in that view. And, and the thing about it is that might explain the transition of forms to some extent. But I'm not entirely, but I won't get into that. But the bigger issue is, for example, humans and chimpanzees are just 2% different. But mice and rats are 20% are different by that same measure. So there, there, it's, what we see is this weird puzzle we see over and over again in biology where function does not correlate with the amount of difference. And, and you know, if God really wanted to make it clear to us that we were different, that we didn't you know, evolve from a common ancestor with chimpanzees, he could have at least made us as different as mice are from rats. But well, he didn't. He, made it, he did it in a way that fits this evolutionary formula, rate times time. 
Yeah, but existence. again, you're looking at the genetic differences as opposed to the morphological differences. Well, I'm agreeing that we're reasons. different. Huh? I'm agreeing that we're functionally different. Right. And so uh, that's a well-chosen control I'm using. So mice and rats aren't that different. So I'm agreeing that we're very different. I'm not saying that we're just chimpanzees. I'm well, agreeing with the image of God. They don't. Well, you mentioned transitional forms. I think that's a good place where you can actually figure out okay, exactly how is God bringing about these changes of life on Earth. And you brought up the example of whales. And what strikes me about whales is that we're talking a naturalistic explanation for those transitional forms. That's like the worst possible set of species you could choose because they have enormous body sizes. They're mammals, low populations, uh, very few progeny per adult. The probability of them generating uh, these uh, transitional forms from a naturalist perspective is very low, but the probability of them going extinct on a fairly rapid basis is high. And so that leads me to believe it's God that steps in and creates all these transitions. Yeah, so I guess the, the difference is that this is my area. So I trust you to some extent on that. And I'm a computational biologist, so I actually approach this. So I know there's qualitative arguments, but I'm much more interested in the mathematical arguments. Well, I mean, and I spent a, I spent a lot of time getting into this. And I guess it's it's not going to be really possible to work out here. But I'm just telling you that I'm not convinced that that's implausible. And this doesn't mean God wasn't involved. It just means that this seems to be the way well, how he did it. Yeah, doesn't it find it puzzling for you, though, that when we look at, say, cockroaches and other insects, we see very few transitions, but we see a whole bunch for whales. We see a whole bunch for primates. It's like, hey, if we're talking a naturalistic answer, it should be the opposite. And yet, this mm -hmm. tells me there's something going on beyond the natural that we need to bring into the equation. I mean, maybe I'm working from a different model of evolution than you, because I wouldn't have said that that's more expected. I would have said differently. I'd say what we see is actually what we expect. Well, what we're trying to do at Reasons to Believe is integrate these evolutionary models uh, with real-time field experiments, you know, conservation biology experiments, which basically tell us, hey, if you're talking mammals with adult body sizes bigger than seven pounds, the models tell us they go extinct before they can undergo any significant evolutionary change which I find consistent what I see in Genesis. For six days, God creates. On the seventh day, he stops. And so I think biology in the seventh day, from a biblical perspective, will be different from biology in the six days. And I find it interesting that the scientific evidence appears to be bearing that out. Things are different before humanity than after humanity. Yeah, so I guess, I don't know if we're actually going to be able to resolve this one. Well, uh, but, but I think that's okay, because I think the way how science works is that it's actually very hard to resolve them in some sort of public debate. In the end, that's okay, right? Well, if you take paleontology, you mentioned paleontology, and you take these conservation biology experiments from a biblical perspective, we're going to see a difference. And so we can go out and actually do the research and say, do we actually see that difference? So that, that's the area where I think we can resolve some of our differences. Yeah, I'm not sure because it, when you do a human experiment, there's one thing that's really missing uh, in those experiments that, that we can't inject into it, which is uh, an, an unobservable amount of time and also a different starting point. So, there, so, so there's going to be a difference. So it's, uh, but you've got long-term evolution experiments working with microbes. Yeah, so once again, I don't, I understand why a lot of these experiments or these reference, I mean, honestly, I was a young earth creationist for a long time. I moved to being an old earth creationist. I was also really caught up in intelligent design too. I was convinced by these things until I actually got to look at the quantitative data for myself and really start to understand how scientific testing of hypothesis worked with genetic data. Mm -hmm. And so it's really that, uh, that ability to not actually go from a high level view of things on a morphological level, but to actually look at the data from the genetic point of view with a mathematical model. And that's where it starts, I mean, it just unequivocally looks that way and it doesn't have to look that way. And like I said, maybe God still made things separate. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna say that, that science can't really speak of what God does. It doesn't really consider that question. But then I, th I think we're just left in this place where he did it in a way that is just so easily mistaken for looking like evolution. So at the very least, it wasn't his goal to disprove evolution. At the very least, that wasn't his design goal when he did it.
Well, I mean, we do both agree life has been here for 3.8 billion years, started simple and got complex. Mm -hmm. The question is how? I think we both agree natural process is a factor, uh, but I'm taking the position it's not just natural process. God is supernaturally intervening. You may agree with that too. Maybe our differences is exactly how does God supernaturally intervene? Well, so what I would oh, sorry. And, uh, well, do we have to go based see? on that, we, we actually need to wrap up pretty soon. So I was wondering if you would just take like one minute to kind of summarize, um, give us a thought to take away for tonight. Um, for both of you, and maybe you yeah, can start I guess uh, um, um, this has actually been really helpful. First of all, I want to thank you, Hugh, for for being here. You didn't have to be. It's, I'm really honored yeah. to have you here. Um, I would say that you you said this before too that different people in different camps have different points of views, right? Like it's not like it's a unified thing. I do affirm evolution, but and and sometimes it's thought that a lot of people who affirm evolution deny the idea of God intervening in things, or deists in some ways. Some people might say. Um, I would say that I, I take a bit of a different view. I'm a bit more of an agnostic in that I think God can do whatever he wants. <laughs> he could have intervened to do these things. I'm just not sure how to prove that from science. I think that's outside the purview of science. And, and knowing what I know about genetics, I don't even think it would be observable. But God can do whatever he wants. And, and I'm, I think the only way I would really know is if he made it clear somehow that he never talks about DNA in scripture. So that's why I'm not sure how he providentially governs evolution, but I'm very open to the idea that he intervenes. Well, I take an integrative approach. It's like, hey, it's not just enough to study Genesis. We need to look at all 66 books of the Bible. And when I do that, I see there's a pervasive appeal. Look to the book of nature. It will reveal God, his characteristics, and his redemptive plan. But it's basically telling us to look at all of the record of nature. So I think to resolve some of these complex questions, we have to integrate across the scientific disciplines. And that's one thing we've done at Reasons to Believe, is take scientists out of academia and give them the freedom to do the interdisciplinary research. And likewise with our theologians, give them the freedom to go through the entire book of the Bible rather than just several chapters. And I think when you do that, you really do see the handiwork of God at work, not just for our existence, but to make it possible for us to eventually enter into an eternal relationship with him. And hey, this is just the beginning. What I find unique about Christianity is a two-creation model. God creates this universe to be a tool to eliminate evil, but he's got a brand new realm involved, uh, which will have different physics, different dimensions, where evil will never exist again. This is just a pathway. So based on that, I don't think we've solved all the problems. <laughs> that we came here to discuss. And I really think that we've um, addressed things in a new and a different way <coughs> than we've been able to in the past. And um, for that, I'd like us all to thank our speakers.